would like to answer a question that I've seen oftentimes, and that is, are you guilty of the blood of the wicked when you fail to witness for Jesus? Okay, I'm going to go to the scriptures today, and I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about this. Um, so let's start out in Ezekiel chapter 3. Back to the Old Testament, to the book of Ezekiel and chapter 3. Uh, there aren't many people that bring this one up, but there are some that do, and they uh, particularly very zealous um, Baptists, a lot of times they'll do this thing of, you know, if you fail to warn the wicked, you've got their blood on your hands. Amen. So get out there and witness. And if you're not witnessing, if you don't lead people to the Lord, if you can't catch fish, then you're not really a fisherman. You're probably not saved. And, and they'll go into this whole big thing, guilt tripping you because you're not filling the pews to pay off the bills, you know, that they owe to the bank. Um, that's what, I mean, cut through all the nonsense. That's what it is. I'm not trying to be a jerk or whatever. I'm just trying to say what really goes on. They want the soul winning thing to be there to increase the numbers of the church members, to increase the giving on a Sunday. That's what it is. Right? And they will cross all kinds of dispensational lines. They'll say, be a good soul winner. There's no such thing as a soul winner in the New Testament. It's back from the book of Proverbs when there was no gospel to preach. <laughs> okay? um, There's no gospel of Jesus Christ to preach. All right? uh, soul winning in the passage in the book of Proverbs, I'll say it one more time. I say it a lot in my studies. Soul winning is a reference to being a, having a winning personality, being very friendly and outgoing. That's what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. All right, but see, they'll, they'll jump dispensational lines to try to get people guilt-tripped into preaching the gospel, which is nonsense. And this is another one that they do. If you don't witness to people, if you're there and you don't say, you don't speak up for Jesus, then you have their blood on your hands. That's what they do. I'm going to show you the doctrinal problems with this for a New Testament Christian. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16 Okay, see if I have that right there. No, I think I wrote down the wrong thing here. Twenty one. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes and it's Ezekiel chapter three, verse sixteen through thirty one, and I'm there's twenty seven verses. <laughs> okay. Verse 21 is where I'm going to be finishing here. Sorry about that. Okay, Ezekiel 3, verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Who's the warning to? The body of Christ. No, it's a warning to the house of Israel. See it there in the context. Verse 17, the house of Israel. Hear the warning at my mouth and give them warning from me to the house of Israel. This isn't written to the body of Christ. We are not the house of Israel. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Okay, there's where you have the teaching about this. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor turn from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Uh-oh. Okay, major doctrinal error right there if you're trying to apply this to a Christian today. If you blow it and you have an opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ and you keep your mouth shut because you're afraid people are going to laugh at you or you're trying to get someplace and you're in a rush, and you'll, it will happen to you. Well, according to this passage there, if you don't warn them, then you've lost your soul. That's what it's saying. If you do warn them, thou hast delivered thy soul. I'm not worried about worrying about uh, delivering my soul. Okay, see, it's, it's a problem. You go back here to try to take this and apply it to a Christian, you have a problem. Let's continue. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness... How can a righteous man turn from his righteousness? Well, when you're back under a works type of salvation system, back in the Old Testament, that could happen. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. What? 
How can you apply that to the New Testament? You can't. Civil so, instruction and righteousness. Well, you're, yeah, you're, we'll get into that in, here in a little bit. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned, and thou also thou hast delivered thy soul. <laughs> That's not New Testament doctrine. I didn't warn a brother in the Lord, you know, he was sinning and I didn't warn him, so I lost my soul. <laughs> what? Uh, no, no. Old Testament. Yeah, that happened there. Remember what happened with the one guy and they go in there and they're attacking these heathen and things and the guy sees this little idol and he says, oh, it's really nice. And he takes it and he puts it in his tent and they go out to battle again. They lose terribly. And what's going on, Lord? And he says, there's sin in the camp. One man's sin but it affects the whole camp. Well, that's not true anymore of us. You see? It isn't for us. It isn't some kind of a thing that now, oh, because brother so-and-so sinned, now pff, the rest of us have to pay for it. No, you'll bear your own burden. You mess up, it'll show up at the judgment seat of Christ, but you aren't going to lose your soul. All right? The wages of sin is death. You mess around with sin, you will die prematurely, but you won't lose your soul. So anybody that goes and they say, well, this, they go to these passages of Scripture right there and they say, if you don't warn the wicked, you will, you know, his blood will be on your hands. How dare you? But did anybody follow this type of thing in the New Testament? Let's look about that. Acts chapter 18. Brethren, there are so many things in the Bible that you can kind of just I know it's not really teaching this, but you can just tweak it just a little tiny bit and get your point across. And you say, it's not really right there, brother. Yeah, I know it isn't, but, you know, between you and me, I, you have to do some of this stuff, you know, to get the tithe up and to get the people to come to church. And, you know, you just have to kind of tweak. It's not right to do that. You can't do that. That's a cloak of covetousness. Acts 18, verse 1 through 6. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the, the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. He said, well, then Paul is following Ezekiel chapter 3. Yes, he is. Why? Because he's a Jew dealing with lost Jews. And he's giving them something that they would know from being in the Old Testament. Seeing that what was written through Ezekiel. They would understand that. So Paul is not writing to Gentiles. He's not dealing with Gentiles, you see. He's dealing with Jews. That's why he's bringing that up. I'm clean from your blood. Well, then we should do it as Gentiles. No, we shouldn't. Let's go next to Acts chapter 20. Back in the woods again, he's barking at squirrels if you can hear that. <laughs> he doesn't like squirrels. Acts chapter 20, verse 17, we'll begin there. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and have kept back, and, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me, 
neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Now look what he says. Wherefore I take you to record, to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Um, he's still saying it there. You say, well, there's Gentiles. But he's talking about going and testifying to the Jews mostly and to the Greeks. But he's an Old Testament Jew coming into the New Testament there. And so he's saying, I'm following what was written there. But where in the New Testament does Paul ever say to a Gentile that they were supposed to witness? And if we don't, then we're guilty of their blood. You see, he's, he doesn't. It's just not there. Let's continue reading here. A couple of verses to make a point here. Verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. All right. Did he say anything about you better witness and, and if you don't, you'll be guilty of their blood? No. He doesn't say anything like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go there next. You go through all the Pauline epistles and you will never find one statement about Paul saying that you will be guilty of the blood of other people if you don't witness to them. So, you see, when you get right down to it, it's actually a very low pressure thing when you are truly, genuinely born again. God has it all under control. You see, the new or the uh, Baptist, whatever crazy kind of thing. I'm, I'm just picking on the Baptist because they're the ones I'm most familiar with coming from that system. Um, but you get, you get others that try to do a soul winning type outreaches and whatever else. And they put this big thing into, you have to win souls. You have to preach the gospel to everybody. It's just so important. And they, they just make you feel this pressure. And, and you go into a store and you're thinking, oh, that's right. I have to witness here. Um, uh, and they say, hi, are you, how are you today? And you think, is, is there an opening there? No, um, I'm very well. How are you? Uh, a beautiful day the Lord's given us out there. And they go, yeah, it is. And so what can I help you with today? And you, oh, I didn't get a chance there. Um, uh, well, I, I'm here for such and such. Um, tell me, uh, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you would go? And they'd go, uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, you know and they, they start making excuses. And, and then you're, I have to win them to Jesus. And if I don't win them to the Lord, I won't be a good Christian. And you get this high pressure thing. And, you know, you hear these guys and they're, they're going out, you know, and, uh, yeah, we were out door to door today and I, I won 50 people to the Lord. Yeah, a little slow this week. Last week it was 380. But, uh, yeah, you know, 50 people today. So it was okay, I guess, you know, not my normal, you know, 300 people at least on average that I win, you know, every weekend. <laughs> And you see that and you go, oh man, I must be lower than a worm or something. I mean, wow, I don't lead 300 people to the Lord every week. Uh, <clears throat> they don't either. Okay, they don't either. Um, I've seen the high pressure salesman type of a thing. And I've known, um, knew a guy actually years ago that uh, people came to his door and they, they just wouldn't take no for an answer. And he finally just said, I just said, okay, what do I have to do? Because he said, I wanted to get rid of them. I had work to do. They came on a Saturday. I'm, it's my day off trying to get work done and whatever around the property. And they're there and they, just, they wouldn't get off my porch. Finally, I just said, what do I? And they said, well, here, bow your head, pray this prayer. And, you know, I okay. And I prayed through the prayer, just said whatever they said to say. And, okay, well, congratulations. You're now a Christian. And here you go. Here's some literature and things. Oh, okay. Oh, well, thank you. And they said, oh, you know, try to come out to church. You know, it'd be good to see you there. And he didn't go. And it took years and years later before the guy finally got saved. But the whole point is, that was a bad example. It wasn't something of, you know, I really would like to be saved. No, he looked at that and said, well, uh, this is weird. 
And I used to go door to door. Hated it. Couldn't stand it. And boy, you know, you come back and, oh, there's other Baptist churches that are getting people saved. And we didn't get anyone saved this week. We had a couple of people say that they'd come out on the, the bus ministry thing. They'd show up and they weren't there Sunday morning when we came to pick them up. I don't know what happened. I, you know, it's just this pressure, pressure, pressure. It's not New Testament Christianity. God is in control. God will bring divine appointments into your life when He is ready. Let's look at what we're supposed to do here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? They're trying to say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And Paul's saying, no, don't do that. But look at verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You plant seeds. You put little snippets of truth out there. You put out some gospel tracts. You just say the right things to people or whatever else. Well, you know, as a Christian, I don't, I'm not into that type of thing. What, what, huh? What? That's weird. What do you mean? That's a seed planted. Any little thing that you can do for the Lord, you're planting seeds. You see? God will, and then you can water that seed later on if they say, hey, I have a question for you. That thing you said to me the other day, tell me more about that. Then you can water the seed or somebody else can water the seed. All right? But God gives the increase. That's how it works. I seem to have missed the thing in there where it says that, uh, um, <clears throat> verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but um, until the people got saved, we were guilty of their blood. No, I, I don't think it's in there. But God gave the increase, um, except for the few times that we didn't turn people you know, away from their sin, and then God required our soul at His hand. It doesn't say that, brethren. Don't be forced into that high-pressure stuff. Verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. All right? God is the one that gives the increase. Um, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Do your own labor. Do your own work. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Labors together with God. That's a flattering thing to think about, isn't it? According to the grace of God which is given me unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Um, lay the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Lead them to the Lord, and then you walk away. You can yeah, tell somebody what to pray or whatever. That's fine. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. You know, here's what you pray. Just bow your head and ask the Lord if they get to that point in time. But uh, it's not up to you, brethren. It's not up to me to get people saved. All that we're doing is we're just putting the truth out there. You know, oh, Brian, if you, what happens if you ever get taken down off of YouTube, you know, and you aren't warning the people that you once did? Are you, in, in, you know, worried about uh, losing your soul or something? No, no, I'm not. So I need to put these teachings out there. They're interspersed, you know, with other sermons I've preached and things in the past. And some of my sermons have been taken down, you know, and things. A lot of my sermons have been taken down by YouTube. And, and some I took down just because of, you know, the, I said things that, you know, I've since changed, you know, it's not quite right what I was saying before. So, um, but this is one that I have I've talked about it in the past, but I don't have a dedicated little study on this. It's not real in-depth because you don't need it to be hugely in-depth with this whole thing. Um, anybody comes out and they try to say that if you don't warn the wicked, then you have their blood on your hands. No. Um, what happens when you are ashamed of the gospel, you um, keep your mouth shut, you just completely blow it, um, you'll answer at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll look and the Lord will say, could have rewarded you there. You know, you will lose reward. Uh, that's what will happen. But uh, you aren't going to lose your soul. Okay, that can't happen. So, uh, just please be encouraged, brethren. Don't let uh, people come along and lie to you and say that, 
uh, you have to do all these things and whatever else to keep your soul or something. No, you don't. So that is going to be it. We'll see you in the next study. Thank you for watching.